Every visionary has a story to tell. These stories educate and inspire us all. You could hear them cranking up in the morning and hear the click, click, click of the roller coaster. It's really feeling satisfied and feeling gratified with bringing happiness to young children, especially families. Working with people who are having a good time is so much better than any other job. Join us as we learn from these trailblazers. You know, people, Lisa, would like to believe that, that Pete and Jack and family had this long-range plan and we knew where we're headed and none of that would be true. Uh, we got into the industry because uh, our dad leased a cave and we were in the cave business for 10 years, discovered there'd been an old town at the entrance of the cave and decided it'd be fun to rebuild that old town primarily for folks that couldn't go through the cave. And we opened in 60 and four times more people came to Silver Dollar City than ever had come to Marble Cave. So we scratched our head and said, we must be in the theme park business. We didn't have a ride at that time. We just had a tilt house and, and a main street, um, all of it incidentally built with $18,000, which was all we could borrow from the bank. Uh, it, it was a theme park in a state that did not have a theme park. So uh, we were Missouri's theme park, even though we were very small and, and without rides. Then we made a commitment to build slowly so that we could provide year-round jobs for our staff. And it worked beautifully. The cave guides were cement block layers and, and uh, Tilt house guides were, were uh, framers for buildings, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, much of what you see that was built here in the first 15 years was all built by the staff right here. Well, my, my mother uh, uh, was the typical German uh, mother who you could never quite please but she drove because we couldn't quite please we worked like the dickens to please her and as I think back on it it was a leadership style I don't know that she thought about it all that much it was a leadership style but it was a phenomenal contribution the other thing that Mary did for Marvel Cave and then Silver Dollar City uh, was she she had a sense of quality and uh, that I didn't have, Pete didn't have. And uh, the, the stories are fairly legendary about me getting fired over not doing what Mary wanted me to do. Uh, she could not read a blueprint. She could not tell from a, from a picture what she liked. She had to see it built and then she could tell you whether it was right or not. So we rebuilt several things in Mary's, in Mary's time, but uh, what a great contribution Mary made to uh, what we enjoy today. I'm the introvert and a detail guy, and Pete's a, one of, the, I think, one of the genius marketers in the United States. So for us to try to do it any other than just follow our natural giftedness would have been a horrible mistake. So, because our, our, our giftedness was so clearly different that, uh, that it, it didn't lead to arguments of who ought to be in charge of this and that and the other thing. It was just so obvious that Pete was the person who ought to be doing the marketing, he ought to be out in front of cameras, and he ought to be uh, meeting and greeting VIPs, etc., and he just did it beautifully. So, uh, you know, this this was a blessing that that we did not have similar giftedness. 
I was invited to go to an American Management Association uh, class for presidents. And, and one of the things that stuck out was they said that as you grow bigger, your opportunity to make a big mistake grows. When you're small, you can't afford it. But as you grow bigger, you can make a big mistake and, and lose your business. So I said, huh. So I asked Pete if he would go, and he had a similar experience. So now we could share our thinking, and we said, we're going to hire four outside men and women of integrity and lots of business experience, and we're going to intentionally have them outnumber us four to two so that if we bore a, an idea and we birthed it and thought it was a great idea but the baby was ugly, the board would tell us. And uh, that was, that's was that been the best single business move I believe we ever made. The first board member was a member of the class that taught me at the American Management Association. And so those four uh, men really set the tone for the board for a long time. It took us probably 15 years to get smart enough to invite a, a woman on the board. And we're in a business, as the theme park industry knows, where almost every decision is made by the adult female in the family as to whether we go, do or don't go to a, an IAAPA property. And, uh, and that was a big, big change. And, and we're very, very grateful for the input that adult females have made on our board. Pete and I both accepted Christ about a month apart in 1960. And we sat right behind me uh, on log uh, after we accepted Christ. And now what is it that we want to do with this asset that we've been uh, privileged to have? And, and so, we decided that, that what we wanted to do was have it be a tasteful witness. And by that, I'm, I, I like to relate it to seasoning a meal. Uh, witnessing, if you do just a little too much of it, you spoil the whole experience. And I think one of the things that people, our guests really appreciate is that our, our, leader, our team, not just our leadership team, but everybody, is free to share their faith as long as it's done in good taste. Bad taste would be to corner you and not let you uh, escape. Uh, but in the music, uh, it, just all around the park, uh, the Christian faith is uh, encouraged, but tasteful, not, not wear your faith on your shirt sleeve, so to speak. Boy, have we had some. Uh, I think uh, it, the humbling experience that I have every time I drive to Silver Dollar City is to go by a 4,000 seat theater that we built uh, in the early 90s and is closed. And then just three miles further down the road, there's Celebration City where we spent $58 million uh, trying to replicate what Disney does in Orlando, and that is to have more than one park. And, we thought it was going to be a great thing because we could extend people, the family's stay, if we had more for them to do. Guess what? They wanted to come back to Silver Dollar City and not go to another theme park. So we were just eating in to some of the repeat business that we were enjoying in Silver Dollar City. So believe me, I understand. Uh, and, and Lisa, as I've done kind of a post-mortem on those big, big mistakes, that the basic fundamental problem is, is being arrogant. Thinking that because you've been in the business for a long time and you know a lot about the theme park business, it can transfer, for instance, to a 4,000 feet theater. Not so. So uh, we have our failures to keep us humble. I think the biggest thing from my perspective 
is the role that IAPA plays in building friendships. In the early years of our being around others in this industry, uh, folks hated one another. You know, if, if you bought a Six Flags ticket, that meant that you weren't going to buy one for Silver Dollar City or vice versa. And so the, the, uh, the industry was not a friendly industry. And I, IAPA played the role of bringing people together now to the point where people want the very best for one another. They want every, every park to, to be immensely successful. And they, they will share ideas and they'll volunteer to help. And I, without IAPA, I don't think that would happen. I don't know uh, is, is the best, most accurate answer. I have tremendous confidence in the creativity that's represented in the industry. You know, if, if we could back up 50 years and say, where is this industry going? We would guess very little of what, what we have today in the industry. But th these are inventive folks and we're gonna continue to uh, do things bigger and better. Uh, one of those things that I think are an example, and again, it sounds like I'm bragging, but here the leadership team decided that we needed to be more than a ride park. And they invented special events. So we start out the year with World Fest and invite countries from all around the world to come. Uh, then bluegrass, then in the fall, Southern Gospel, and then a fall craft festival, and then a Christmas festival. That's an example to me uh, of how creativity is going to continue. What's the next uh, special event idea that's huge? And lots and lots of parks now have special events, but they didn't have them 50 years ago. We came up with a, a, a ride we built ourselves called Rube Dugan's Diving Bell. We have a lake here and, and uh, we thought, wouldn't it be fun? We've taken people underground and, and done all kinds of things with them, put them on stagecoaches and trains. Wouldn't it be fun if we made believe like we were taking people under that lake? So we built a diving bell. It was about 30 feet across. And, and about every 10 minutes, a diving bell would go off down into the lake. And you walked into a building and you didn't know it, but there were three diving bells there that didn't move, but they all sat on a big ball so that we could go left, right, front, back. And the film that showed you what you were seeing was filmed through three quarters of an inch of water. And so it had bubbles and very, very believable. And uh, Disney, believe it or not, came to little old Silver Dollar City and said, we love your technology. And several of the rides at Disney now are very similar to Rube Dugan's Diving Bell. I don't say that as a bragging story, but, it, but it, when you think of what you'd like to bring back, uh, I'd love to have Rube Dugan's Diving Bell back.